no good. There's a lot of it around, etc. So we want to now be a little bit more precise. We talked about alliances, and consortia, competitions, and blah, blah, blah. I really want to start to unpack it now. We're not today going to look at intellectual property and licensing, although it's really, really important. It's so important we're going to spend almost a whole session on it later in the module. Okay, so do not fear. We'll park that to one side. Uh, so today we're going to look at very briefly the other three quadrants there. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, supply linkages, outsourcing, not quite the same thing, but the similar sort of logic. And um, we'll look at different forms of relational collaboration and we'll try to make a <coughs> distinction between alliances and joint ventures because how you manage them is sort of subtly different. Okay, so we're sort of trying to be a little bit more specific about what flavour, if you like, of open innovation that we're trying to manage here. Okay, so if you like, the most common one, not necessarily the simplest, is a sort of um, uh, a sort of vertical supply relationship. You know, almost any organisation, certainly any business, will have it. Maybe a very simple one, an input from somewhere, but often it's multiple inputs. Yeah, logistics, multiple components, services, and such like. So you have some sort of supply network or chain, depending on the nature of the business. Uh, and sometimes that can spread to things like products and service development. You'll work with some of those partners, what is possible. And there are classic examples where most of the innovation happens in the supply chain. So things like um, the food industry. If you look at the food industry um, empirically, then you find that most of the innovations about storage, packaging, uh, logistics happen and originate from suppliers, not from retailers, not from users. Okay? So it's a particular type of um, uh, use, um, supply chain innovation. Okay? Now, typically, I say typically, these tend to be relatively short-term relationships, maybe with the exception of certain sectors like, say, consumer durables. So Korean, Japanese car industry tend to have slightly longer-term relationships, but even those are much shorter than they used to be. Uh, before. Uh, main reasons are to sort of get specialisation so you can drive down uh, cost in the supply chain and to reduce lead time. Often there'll be sort of uh, parallel working. We saw in the case of Zara, you'll have short supply chains that you can respond very quickly to fashion changes, for example. Uh, the downside, so called transaction costs. Now, in economics, those who have done economics, transaction costs are a very specific uh, theoretical. Um, idea, concept, whatever you want to call it. Empirically, it's not great. Okay, but we use it more broadly here about, if you like, the general grief of working with other organisations. So although we argued earlier that it has certain um, <coughs> reductions in uncertainty and potentially increases in efficiency because you focus on the things you're good at, yeah? So you had both efficiency gains and uncertainty reduction, excellent. We're saying the downside is you need to balance that against the additional, if you like, costs and burden of working with other organisations. Okay, so things like they may rip you off, they may charge you too much if it's not a real market. Yeah. They may not deliver. I don't mean deliver, it may not actually they don't deliver, but they may not, if it's product development, deliver the specification. So there's a whole bunch of things, sometimes hidden, sometimes explicit. So we need to balance the two up. Licensing, we're not going to talk about today in any detail, spend a whole session looking at IP, but I'd argue um, it's an intermediate stage. It tends to have a specified term, as we'll see when we look at that. And then you negotiate things like the scope, the geographical scope, product scope, and such like. We'll spend a session looking at that. Uh, consortia tend to have a limited period also. And you see that often the rationale is to have either shared early pre-competitive research. If you look at most European programs, for example, Horizon 2020 framework program, which is much older than Horizon 2020, at least in theory, these are pre-competitive. So the idea is that you bring organisations together, not necessarily companies, it can be universities, uh, commercial research organisations, in, in some sort of consortia, uh, but temporarily and often in a pre-competitive stage. And the idea is then subsequently they will go the separate ways and then differentiate and compete in some uh, end market. Okay. Uh, other reasons for consortia um, are things like open handset alliance is standard setting. Yeah, so you can create a bigger market and also create uh, a new market for complementary products and services. So standard setting um, is a, a very common rationale. Often competitors will get together at least temporarily to do that. The downside consortia are there are often competitors within those groups and we're beginning to see tensions within the Open Handset Alliance 
you know, as Google moves into everything, basically, including your houses. Um, but also, Samsung is also developing operating systems initially at the down end, so they're beginning to compete on both operating systems but also on, on hardware, on phones and such like. So the tensions are beginning to appear in that particular group, and we'll see what happens. Um, okay, disadvantages, there's a bunch of them, but the main one really, the, the main two, sorry, knowledge leakage, what does that mean? Well, you're potentially competitors, and it may be pre-competitive, and it may be to set standards, but you have to exchange information, technical and otherwise. Yeah? And unlike lawyers, engineers, yeah, they talk to each other. They get excited about things. They let secrets out. Okay? So often there's unintended sort of consequences of sharing of knowledge. Uh, and then the other problem is, if it's pre-competitive, is how do you subsequently differentiate when you've worked together initially, say, to develop the, sort of, um, the platforms or the prototypes? Okay, so it makes differentiation harder, subsequently. And you see that in the sort of Android universe, is that there are relatively low levels of differentiation. It's quite hard to do that because basically they have to confirm, uh, conform to certain technical standards. But they're still better than Apple. Okay, um, I'll pause the recordings. Okay, and then here we get where the definitions get problematic. Um, people talk about collaboration, alliances, joint ventures as if they're one thing. Now, okay. There are numerous definitions, some legal, some not legal, okay, but we need to have some sort of working definition to make sense of this, because what, when you use them and how you use them are quite different. So, generally speaking, an alliance, whether it's strategic or otherwise, has some sort of um, temporary or transient rationale, yeah? So, we're going to compete with this, we're going to develop a new standard, a new product, yeah? And if you like, the, the rationale would disappear at a certain point. The competitor disappears, you produce a competing standard, okay, and then the rationale starts to evaporate. So they tend, tend to be um, not a fixed duration, but a sort of objective-based duration. You know, when we have developed a standard, when we have a competing product, when we've entered this new market, when we developed a prototype, and that's sort of, you know, a movable target. But once that target's achieved, often the partners go their separate ways, okay? Um, a joint venture usually has a more formalized, um, a more relational basis. Okay, and the main, is that true? Yeah, the main two types of joint venture are prescribed. So one is contractual. So you literally get a bunch of lawyers and you sit down the partners with the lawyers and they write out a partnership agreement. Sounds easy? It isn't. Okay. Well, we had a company, and it took us a year and a half to agree a partnership agreement with one other company. <laughs> and lots and lots of lawyers' fees, yeah? It can be very time-consuming, lots of trade-offs and, and bargaining and such like. And you're trying to anticipate almost every eventuality, including competing with each other in the future, yeah? So it's a very expensive, time-consuming, and potentially antagonistic process. So that's a contractual um, joint venture, okay, and that will specify who the terms and what happens, one partner does this and that, and that's why it gets very time consuming and legalistic. The other is um, uh, some sort of equity-based organisation. You get combinations of the two, so you might have, you might share some sort of um, uh, equity between your companies if you're quoted, or your private companies with, with share stock, uh, or you might have some sort of exchange of directorships and such like that, so some more sort of relational basis. But what they have in common is they tend to be more long-term than alliances. Alliances tend to say, we've got to do this, and often we've got to do it quite quickly. And once we've done this, we can, we can uh, basically move on. Yeah? So alliances tend to have a very specific singular objective. And uh, if that's achieved, or even if it's not achieved, then the partners go their separate ways. Joint ventures, whether they're contractual or some sort of equity or director-based ones, tend to be more durable, partly because they're more time-consuming to set up, but also they're more relational. Often they have multiple objectives. Okay, it's not just we're going to have this standard or we're just going to develop this platform. It's often we're going to work together to do this thing. Yeah? And this thing could be quite a big thing. A yeah? whole new business, for example. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and networks are really, um, what's the expression? Aggregations of all those things. You know, if you look at any real organisation that's been around more than a few years and you draw it in the middle of your, your sort of network, and then you start to say, well, who do they work with? And then you map out their suppliers, 
And you might map out partners they work with. You might map out licensing agreements they have, both inbound and outbound. And you end up with a huge, literally a network of relationships really quite quickly. Okay? So a network often is all of these things and more. It's more because there are often unintended consequences. Because yeah, the network can then constrain you on what you can do, but it also presents opportunities that weren't originally planned in those relationships. Okay, so the thing about networks is the so-called emergent properties. A bit of jargon, but you'll hear it. So emergent properties simply mean you didn't plan for it. Okay, some of them are good, some of them not so good. Okay, because they're aggregations across time of all these types of relationships. Okay. Uh, the simplest one, I think, is the supplier one. It's not, the most, it's not trivial by any means, but it's the most common and probably most researched type of relationship. Most of the stuff that you'll see in terms of um, research on this is down, really, down the bottom left-hand corner. Yeah, bottom left-hand corner. And the sort of where you have a clear, um, often homogenized input, could be a product or a service. In other words, you have competition between suppliers. And then the question is, how do you, if you like, engender that competition to drive down costs and to increase the power in negotiation? And you see that in sectors like retail, yeah, where there are often several competing um, inputs, if you like, with very similar offerings. They're not highly differentiated. And therefore, they tend to compete on price and sometimes things like delivery and, and stuff like that. And that's the sort of bread and butter of supply chain management. And there's things like you know, queuing theory and that. In terms of innovation, you move up that, if you like, that sort of value chain diagonally to the right. And so in the middle somewhere there, we've got sort of longer term relationships, partnership arrangements, maybe more uh, longer term, might be more formalized, they might be contractual or otherwise. Um, and you see that where in particular, there's something beyond simply producing inputs to products and services. So it might be co-development, for example, uh, of a new product or a new service. So when you start to get in the innovation area, it tends to go move away from a simple market relationship Okay, it tends to be slightly more uh, contractual or relational in the sense it moves towards that centre ground. And you see that in areas like uh, the car industry, uh, we said already the food industry, uh, where you have a much closer relationship with a subset of the supply base for the purpose of innovation. Yeah? So if you look at companies like um, uh, Marks & Spencer's, it has had very long-term relationships with companies like Northern Food for innovation in, in, in foods. You might have guessed that part, yeah. Um, with DuPont in terms of materials and fabrics, okay, different properties, very long-term relationship, very successful one, such like, okay. Uh, and then the sort of top right-hand one are, you know, sort of, um, if you like, less sort of um, permanent um, and more scouting, searching for um, potential partners. It's more like a sort of lead user uh, approach. So it's more like the sort of searching. We want to develop X, who could work with us to co-develop X? Whereas the one in the middle is more relational. Yeah, we've worked with Northern Foods for 25 years, DuPont 15 years, been successful, you know, why bust it? Okay, so different, if you like, sort of intensities of, of collaboration as you go along there. Um, mm, okay, joint ventures are, as we said, more formalized still, and they not necessarily um, vertical relationships in the supply chain, they're often horizontal. So they could be potential competitors, they could be with um, other types of partner, could be universities, unlikely, frankly, if you look at the data, uh, but there could be other types of um, development organisation, commercial and otherwise. And we go back to that idea of complementary assets that we spoke about when we looked at strategy and such like. It's a lot of the rationale in collaboration for the purpose of innovation is trying to get those complementary sort of capabilities or assets to work together. Okay, so whether it's sort of, you know, the sort of example Chrysler and Fiat or Airbus, though at least one of the rationale in each of those types is to access those complementary capabilities. So the idea is, you know, you can't do it internally yourself because you don't have all those capabilities, but it, acquisition generally is too expensive or uncertain. In the case of Chrysler, they went the whole way, um, presumably not very clever. Uh, and there is an intermediate stage, which we'll talk about next week when we look at venturing and entrepreneurship, uh, but it's a slightly different. But here we're talking about um, where there's sort of, if you like, a, an absence of capabilities or expertise. Yeah? So the idea is then the rationale for the joint venture is to gain access to those, but not in a sort of market transaction. Okay? Why wouldn't you just simply go down a market transaction? 
which we'll talk about when we look at licensing and things like that. Because basically a license, generally speaking, is a market trans... Well, it's a legal document, but it's, but it's more like a market transaction. It's highly codified and usually freely available. Not freely, but available in the marketplace. You can buy a license, yeah. Why wouldn't you just simply... So put it another way. Why would you go down a joint venture route rather than, say, licensing? Or buying them? the know-how in the marketplace. Because it's highly risky, because you're also entering into a relationship, you know, and that, as we'll see in a moment, is problematic. Why might you have to go down into a sort of relational approach rather than simply a transactional one? You may have uh, access to knowledge. Yeah, yeah, different types of knowledge. Uh, we haven't spent much time talking about different types of knowledge, and we'll do a little bit of that when we look at intellectual property. But yeah, different types of knowledge. So it could be how codified it is or how tacit to use your term yeah so if it's highly codified to use that term often you can specify it in a contract and a license and, and you won't enter into a joint venture some of it is more complex more social harder to specify tacit yeah in which case you'll need to have some sort of relationship to acquire or transfer that know-how yeah so often there's a different one of the reasons why you might enter into a joint venture is to acquire different types of knowledge stuff that's not so readily codified and in the market.